about municipal debt. Um, and, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not an economist. I, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I only just started really studying this issue intensely in the last few months. Um, and when I was first approached to come and give this presentation, I really resisted. I didn't want to do it. I was very hesitant because I thought, you know, I don't know enough. I haven't been reading enough. I haven't been studying enough. It's so detailed. It can get very technical. I don't want to sound stupid. Um, but, you know, I also realized that that's one of the weapons of the 1% is that like this stuff, financialization and, and indebtedness and how this all works is we're just, we're not smart enough to figure it out. Like we need to leave that to the smart people, to the ones who know, and it's all being handled by uh, the elites and we can't even talk about it. And I think that that's wrong. And even uh, even if we feel that way, we need to um, try to move past that and try to begin to talk about these things, even if they're complicated and even if they're really technical. So that's what I'm gonna try to do today. Um, what, what I'm going to do is try to talk for maybe 15 minutes. Um, it's a lot, it's a big issue, I don't want to bore you, but I'll talk for a few minutes and then hopefully we'll have some time to figure out how we can organize around, around this very, very important issue. I'll start with just giving you some, um, what are the effects of municipal indebtedness and then kind of move backwards. Um, some famous kind of uh, effects. So earlier this summer, uh, you may have seen on the news, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, lowered all the salaries for all their public employees in the entire city down to minimum wage, $7.25 an hour. Uh, firefighters, police, teachers, everybody on the city payroll, their pay was cut to minimum wage. NBC News does a story, they have reporters there, everyone's saying, interviewing the mayor, and he's saying, I don't know, we just don't have enough money, we have to do this, we have no choice, it's budget cuts, etc., etc. Okay. Um, in Stockton, California, uh, after the 2008 housing crash, the entire economy um, basically exploded. They're now in bankruptcy. Um, the city has cut 25% of its police force, 30% of its fire department, and over 40% of all city employees. And now the city is considering cutting a pension for its retirees um, in order to make the creditors happy um, in its bankruptcy filing. Uh, so that's another example. In New York City, our transit system is seriously in debt. Uh, since 2010, 300 bus lines have been cut, two subway lines have been cut. This affects the poorest New Yorkers, people of color, immigrants, working class folks trying to get to work, people who don't have cars. Um, there have been mass layoffs, okay? Um, in Boston, Boston has the most indebted transportation system in the country. Uh, the finances are so dire that officials in Boston are threatening to cut subway, train, and bus service by 43% to save money. It's really, it affects uh, almost everyone. Right, we ride public transportation, so we have to ask what's going on here. What's going? Why is the, why are the budgets being cut? Why is this financial crisis happening? And really, what it is is like we have a post what they call a post Keynesian economy, where we don't publicly fund municipalities anymore. The federal government doesn't fund them. Public public um, uh, public is very averse to raising taxes. So uh, instead of a publicly financed municipalities, we have debt financed municipalities. So what happens is. Um, Municipalities now, the, one of the only funding sources they have is through the issuance of municipal bonds. So what they do is um, a municipality, which could be um, a city, uh, a state in some cases, or a, a town, or even like a small development district within the town, hmm. can issue a, a bond. And the banks buy these bonds. And then um, the bondholder, which would be like J.P. Morgan Chase, right, then lends the issuer money. You sell me a bond, and I will give you $100 million to build your sewer, huh. right? And in exchange for that cash up front, I'm going to pay from the municipality, I have to pay the bond uh, buyer interest for the life of the loan. And eventually, the principal will come due. Um, also, um, the interest rates on these bonds can be fixed or variable, just like in the housing market. So there's a lot that's similar there as well. Mm. Um, the municipal debt story actually began in New York City. There was a fiscal crisis in the 1970s. Um, and what happened is, in order to get out of that mess, uh, the city um, used uh, pension funds to back loans from Wall Street. So this idea that we just borrow our way out of fiscal crises and mm. keep kicking the can down the road, kind of, you could trace it back to New York City fiscal crisis. So one of the things that we're trying to talk about in the strike debt campaign, which I'm a part of and which produced this uh, manual, is that debt is a system. It's a primary mechanism by which wealth is extracted from communities all around the country. 
and municipal debt is certainly one way to do that. Also, municipal debt is very profitable for people. They make debt on top of the debt. Um, so eventually somebody has to pay these bonds, though. They do come due. Um, and that's always the 99%. It's always uh, the people. So that's what we have in places like Scranton and Stockton, California, and New York City and Boston is American austerity, which is service cuts, layoffs, um, and wage cuts in order to try to make these payments to, to bankers. Um, so uh, what happened in Scranton, in fact, was it threatened a default on one of these bonds. The par its parking authority owed several hundred million dollars to Wall Street, and it threatened to default because it didn't have the money. Wall Street came down with an iron fist, cut off the city's uh, access to credit markets, and it could no longer pay its debts because in a debt-financed economy, a credit is the only way to pay for anything. Um, another example that we can talk about is with Jefferson County, Alabama, which in 2011 filed what was at that time the largest municipal bankruptcy in American history. Um, they had a $4 billion debt, most of it was for a sewer. A sewer system. So officials in Jefferson County borrowed billions from Wall Street to remake the, to repair the sewer. Uh, they were corrupt, they you know, peddled contracts to their cronies in the government. Uh, long story, 17 uh, city officials were eventually jailed. Morgan Chase insists on um, not letting the city out of. Um, in Boston, they're so in debt in Boston that 33 cents of every dollar spent on public transportation goes to pay interest on the debt. Um, other cities whose transportation is debt financed, Baton Rouge, Boston, Charlotte, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, San Francisco, San Jose, Washington, D.C. All these systems are essentially in the same boat. Um, in order to finance, to pay these debts, the cities often sell off their assets. Um, so it's privatization. In Chicago, the Skyway Toll Road, which is a seven-mile stretch of highway, has been leased to a private company, so that company can collect tolls on that road. Wow. Uh, for the next 99 years, that, sold, that road has been sold to a private company. Um, the city of Atlanta uh, privatized its water supply in the 90s to pay its debts to Wall Street. It eventually did cancel the contract at great expense because uh, the water was tainted. Um, we should also, we, since we're here, we have to talk about the World Trade Center. World Trade Center site is basically owned by multinational banks. Uh, it was largely constructed, probably through insurance, but it was also constructed through what they called Liberty Bonds, right? Liberty. Huh. Uh, where multinational banks would, um, would basically fund the construction of the buildings to replace the, the ones that were, uh, that fell down during the, after the terrorist attacks. Um, so, just to give you an example, Goldman Sachs uh, needed a new headquarters. So um, they they provided the the funding to build their 40 story uh, the 40 story um, tower right across from the old World Trade Center site, and it cost about three billion dollars. And then, right when they were getting to the end of the process, um, Goldman Sachs kind of started to back off a little bit, and they said, "Wait a minute, actually, we we're not sure we want to move in." We've, we've uh, we profit already from building this 
office and now we don't want to move in. And the city got really scared because they need Goldman Sachs to, for some reason, they want Goldman Sachs to uh, be located um, in lower Manhattan. So after Goldman Sachs had already profited from the building of its own office in lower Manhattan by, ish, by, the, by through bonds, the city then gave them over $100 million of cash and public subsidies to then finally agree to move into the building that they had been financing. Um, the thing with Goldman Sachs is they're the most profitable Wall Street, they're the most profitable, profitable firm in Wall Street history, and one of the most profitable companies in the world. They could have paid for the entire office and the entire uh, infrastructure uh, themselves for what they earned in about two months. <laughs> so they don't need any public subsidies, but yet they received hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it's very hard to get out of these municipal bond transactions. Um, in many cases, federal bankruptcy codes guarantee that creditors will be paid no matter what. Orange County, California declared bankruptcy in the 90s. Uh, all, through negotiations with the courts, all the creditors ended up being paid. In fact, they, they got more money than they were actually owed. Because Orange County was so afraid of pissing off Wall Street that they actually gave them more money in the end because they were they wanted to stay in good graces with since debt is the only way they can finance their basic operations. Um, so since 2008, New York State has in fact paid $243 million to terminate municipal bond deals with Wall Street. So they've, they've paid $243 million to get out of these deals. $191 million of that was financed by new debt. So we are borrowing money, paying down, we're, we're taking on new debt to pay down old debt. Somehow this makes sense to them. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, when you start to read about this stuff, what you see is that, like, um, if you're a student and you take out a loan or you buy something on a credit card, like, that's debt. It's, the whole definition of debt changes. Like, to these guys, their debt is not debt. Our debt is debt. Their debt doesn't count as debt, right? Um, Illinois is one of the worst offenders. Chicago is completely debt financed, that city. Um, and there's a whole thing with the teacher strike that I could go into. I think that's all really just about municipal debt. Um, but for example, and this is comes this goes to the idea of like what debt is and how we define it. In 2011, the governor of Illinois issued eight billion dollars in public debt through bonds to pay the interest on debts already on the books. So he issued new debt to pay down the debt. And when he did that, he said, "This is not new borrowing." So to them, when you take out debt to pay new debt, that's not debt because they get to say what debt is. We don't. They do. Um, so, the next question is like, what can we do about this? It's a very obscure thing, it's, it's kind of technical, um, you know, it's, it's huge, it's about a $3.7 trillion market, um, it affects almost every municipality in the country, um, we're all debtors to Wall Street when it comes to municipal debt, but there have been some actions that we can look to for inspiration. Um, in Brooklyn, where I live, a few blocks from my apartment, the new arena for the Brooklyn Nets basketball team was built partially on land that was condemned uh, before being transferred to developers and municipal bonds uh, were part of the funding. And community activists in Brooklyn d delayed the construction of this arena for years. You know, it's, it's obviously they didn't win in the end, but they delayed the construction for years and were able to um, to um, point out some of the problems with the financing of the arena. Um, in Scranton, which I mentioned at the beginning, um, the municipal unions actually sued the city and they won and their wages were restored uh, earlier this summer. Baltimore is suing more than a dozen big banks for manipulating LIBOR, which is the benchmark for many interest rates on financial products. Um, the LIBOR interest rate is very, very important when it comes to municipal debt because these the interest rates, many of them are pegged to LIBOR. So when Wall Street uh, manipulates the interest rate, uh, they're essentially stealing from every city, town, village, municipality in the country. In fact, um, there's a big uh, article in Rolling Stone a couple months ago by Matt Taibbi about municipal bond rigging, and he calls it the scam Wall Street learned from the mafia, <laughs> which is basically Wall Street, you know, stealing a little bit from every single person in America, and that's their business model. And they do this through municipal, municipal bond rigging. Um, so you can read about that in Rolling Stone, it's fascinating. Um, in July, and this is more activist stuff, uh, a group called the Boston Fair Strike declared a free fair day and held turnstiles open in the subway to protest uh, fair hikes and protest Wall Street's vice grip on their city transportation budget. 
so it's a great idea. Um, after the LIBOR scandal also broke, um, Oakland, California, it's a very interesting case, is trying to sever its relationship with Goldman Sachs for good. Oakland is involved in one of these interest rate swap deals with Goldman Sachs that's, cost, that's costing it hundreds of million dollars a year. Um, Goldman Sachs is not hearing, they, they are not interested in negotiating. They insist the city must pay what it owes. Um, and this is important. Um, an important aspect of this is here's what Lloyd Blankfein, who's the CEO of Goldman Sachs, here's what he said in response to press inquiries about uh, Oakland trying to get out of these deals. He said, the fact of the matter is, we're a bank. And I think this is very interesting. <laughs> he is absolutely right. It's like, yes, all of this is perfectly legal. I mean, the LIBOR thing, there are some lawsuits that are happening there. Bracketing that, all this is perfectly legal. This is just the way they do business. He's a their bank. This is what they do. It's not something that regulation can fix. The SEC already looks out for investors, not municipalities that issue these bonds. That's well documented. Um, this is simply how capitalism works. It's what banks do. Um, so in order to fix this, we can't just tweak it or, like, you know, try to institute new regulations. We need to totally rethink how we fund cities and their operations. So this is one thing we're trying to do in the strike debt campaign. There's a chapter on municipal debt in the manual. Um, we're trying to recognize that indebtedness is not only a characteristic of individuals. It's something that affects everybody. It's systemic. Um, and, and it poses a lot of opportunities for Occupy um, because municipal debt belongs to everybody. So it really symbolizes um, the debt system and the structural nature of this. I want to just end with, um, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about ways, if there's time, that we might organize around this issue. But I want to just end with one Occupy activist in Birmingham, Alabama, who is organizing um, in protest of the city's $4 billion sewer debt. She said, this debt shouldn't ever have been issued, and therefore it shouldn't exist. It shouldn't have been spent. Since it shouldn't have existed, we are not going to pay it. Hmm. I think that's the place where we should begin.